Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Pastoral message of the US Catholic bishops, 1994. Our families are torn by violence. Our communities are destroyed by violence. Our faith is tested by violence. We have an obligation to respond. Violence in our homes, our schools and streets, our nation and world is destroying the lives, dignity, and hopes of millions of our sisters and brothers. Fear of violence is paralyzing and polarizing our communities. Beyond the violence in our streets is the violence in our hearts. Hostility, hatred, despair, and indifference are at the heart of a growing culture of violence. This country has one of the highest rates of interpersonal violence of any industrialized country. This should disturb our souls and make us wonder how human beings can be so violent. This is not just about shootings in public places, everyday occurrences of domestic violence, bullying in schools, gang violence in our cities, and so much more means that believers need to understand the evil impulses of violence and what we can do in response. It raises the question of why violence happens in the human race. Yes, what, what is the root causes of violence today? And, and I believe it's complex. However, I believe it is fear, power, and hatred that bring about the violence today. Fear. Howard Thurman, philosopher, theologian, educator, civil rights leader, and author of the book, Jesus and the Inherited Right, writes, fear is one of the persistent hounds of hell that dog the footsteps of the poor, the deprived, and the disinherited, the disowned. There is nothing new or recent about fear. It is as old as man. And there are many kinds of fears. Fear of objects, fear of people, um, fear of the future, fear of nature, fear of the unknown, fear of old age, fear of disease, and fear of life itself. Our churches are crowded with people who are haunted day and night because of some fear. Fear, the economically and socially insecure live in fear. People who struggle to provide for their basic needs live in constant worry, fear. Our children, our children have many fears, gun violence, bullying, not fitting in, not having enough, fear. Fear arises out of the sense of isolation and helplessness. Fear. Fear comes from uncertainty. We are afraid of losing what we have, whether it's our life or our possessions. Fear. Oh yeah, we fear that we don't understand. We make judgments based on past experiences with people or situations. Our ignorance and misinformation 
of other races and cultures and religions have contributed to our fears. Fear can cause panic or rage, and in a moment can become actual violence. Power. The lust for power is connected with fear. Those in power have a fear of losing power. The fear is rooted deep in the relationship between the weak and the strong, between the controllers and those who are controlled. Limitless power is a weapon by which the Powerless are held in check. The lives of the powerless are lightly held by the more powerful. They must be made to feel that they are alien. Hate and resentment. I have noticed an increase in rudeness. There is a silence about hatred. Hatred must be born in the mind. Hatred in the mind and spirit is born out of bitterness that is made possible by sustained resentment, which is bottled up. Let me give you an example. Suppose you are one of five children in a family and it happened again and again, that if there was just enough for four children in any given circumstance, you were the child who had to do without. If there were money for four pairs of shoes or four slices of cake, the discrimination continues. Resentment grows. Hatred becomes for you a source of validation the hatred gives one a sense of significance. Hate does not empower, it decays. We cannot follow God and hate. The pastoral message from the USCCB reads, our social fabric is being torn apart by a culture of violence that leaves children dead on our streets and families afraid in their homes. Our society seems to be growing numb to human loss and suffering. A nation born in a commitment to life liberty and the pursuit of happiness is haunted by death, imprisoned by fear, and caught up in the elusive pursuit of protection rather than happiness. Fear, lust for power, hate and resentment have become a plague in our society. How can this be true in the America 
that professes to be the shining city on the hill, welcoming the tired, the poor, the huddled masses yearning to be free. The America, which is the country of immigrants. There is no fear in love. Perfect love drives out all fear. We cannot follow God and hate. Perfect love drives out all fear. Our nation is stuck. Our nation has been stuck a long time. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. What was the root causes of violence in Jesus's day? Did Jesus deal with fear, lust for power, hate, and resentment? Yes. King Solomon wrote that there is nothing new under the sun. Jesus was living in a time in a city that was obsessed with corruption and power. We understand that there was fear, lust for power, hatred, and resentment. He was living in a time where Rome had its boot on the neck of the people. He was living in a time where the zealots were taking up arms in the name of religion and any and all methods were justified in the struggle to escape the bondage of Rome. He was living in a time where the leaders of the temple, who should have been leading the way, were more interested in their own power than justice. The Pharisees, scribes, and rabbis were religious fundamentalists who focused on strict observance of the Jewish laws, ceremonies, and traditions. The Sadducees, consisted of the priesthood and certain wealthy Jews. The Sadducees were opposed to Jesus because there was the supposed threat that Jesus could potentially overthrow the Roman government, which would jeopardize their positions of prestige and power. Both were really religious parties. And of course, there were also Samaritans with whom the Jews had no dealings, even though they held similar views regarding Jewish teachings. Who would be the Samaritans of today? Who? Twisted interpretations of the law. Jesus was perceived by the ruling classes as their enemy. What we've missed is that the Pharisees and the Sadducees were not just religious leaders, they were also political leaders during Jesus' time. Judea had been conquered by the Romans and was an occupied territory. However, the Romans did not run everything. As long as the Jewish people paid their taxes and didn't revolt, Re Rome had little interest in their internal affairs. In return for their support, the Roman rule, the Sadducees kept their wealth and privileged positions secure. The Sanhedrin was the chief legislative body in Judea and was composed of Sadducees and Pharisees. It had political, legislative, judicial, and religious functions. Members of the Sanhedrin were the equivalent of the congressmen and senator, senators that represent us today. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. As in most farming societies, about 10% of the population was born into nobility and lived lavishly. 
the remaining 90% worked the fields around Nazareth, growing grapes, olives, and grain. In Bethlehem, where it's drier, sheep and goats were raised. The people were farmers, raising one bag of food for themselves and one for Herod or Caesar. Some may have been better off than others. A biblical scholar named John Dominic Crossan said in an interview in Christian Century Magazine, I think it's safe to say that by our standards, injustice was built into this system. 10% hmm. at the top control virtually everything. It is safe to say that Jesus was born and lived in an oppressive society in which they were heavily taxed. While the rich prospered, the peasants suffered. And their hatred for Herod and the Romans grew. Do you see what was happening over 2,000 years ago? Hmm. It's happening today. How did Jesus respond to the violence? What, what did he say? So when Jesus began his public ministry, his first words were these, and I know you've heard this, the spirit of the Lord is on me because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoners and recovery of sight for the blind, to set the oppressed free, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. And that is exactly what Jesus did. Throughout the gospels, we see that Jesus proclaimed good news for the poor, both spiritual and physical. He healed the blind and set the oppressed free. He challenged the political leaders of his day to enforce the important matters of God, of God's law, justice, mercy, love, others more than self, turning the other cheek, lifting up the oppressed, caring for the sick, giving possessions to the poor. The one and only time Jesus' anger was visibly displayed was when he violently threw off the temple grounds, the corrupt money changers and thieves, as Jesus called them, who were using religion to prey on the poor. He said, seek ye first the kingdom of God. The heart of his message was political. It was about the coming of the kingdom of God. That passion led him in his teachings and actions to proclaim the kingdom of God. In Jesus's world, kingdom language was political. Jesus's hearers knew about the other kingdoms empire of rome the kingdom of herod but the kingdom of god was different the kingdom of god was different the kingdom of god is for the earth as is spoken in the lord's prayer thy kingdom come thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven it is about the transformation of this world What life would be like on earth if God were ruler and the lords of domination systems were not? It would be a world of economic justice 
in which everybody had the material basis of existence. And it would be a world of calm, not fear. A world of love, not hate. A world of economic justice. A world of peace and nonviolence. The kingdom of God, the dream of God, a transformed world. If Jesus had wanted to avoid the political meaning of kingdom language, he could have spoken of the family of God or the community of God or the people of God, but he didn't. He spoke of the kingdom of God. Jesus's message of love and radical equality caused friction. Jesus is a religious and political agitator. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Jesus, in the face of hatred, showed love and compassion. He rejected violence again and again. When Jesus was on his way to the cross, the disciples took out a sword and cut off the ear of the high servant. Jesus picked up the ear and restored him. Jesus healed the soldier and he told his disciples to put away their swords and stated all who live by the sword will die by the sword. Instead of picking up a sword, he asked that they put it away. You know, as humans, our first response might be hatred or rage, retaliation or revenge and wanting to strike back, um, sowing seeds of fear and hatred and division. Violence only begets violence. Jesus is teaching us how to be human. He is teaching us leading us into a way of peace. He suffered, but he refused to give in to fear, power, hate, and resentment. He came to usher in the kingdom of God, a kingdom of peace and The Romans executed Jesus because he preached his kingdom of God, a kingdom based on peace and justice over the empire of Rome, which ruled by violence and force. For Jesus, peace cannot be won the Roman way through military victory, but only through justice and fair and equal treatment of all people. Jesus resists the violence of empire while standing for justice. Jesus's teachings regarding Christian discipleship govern not only the actions of private persons, but also those of public officials dis discharging their official duties. They must include personal and political morality, ethical teaching. Working for justice in the United States today represents the continuation of Jesus's mission. How do we overcome violence and hatred? How? 
It's not just about loving and saying that we love. If you truly love, you must act. God cares about the least of these. We live out love. He pointed to three groups of people. Reading from Deuteronomy 10, he defends the cause of the fatherless and the widow and loves the foreigner residing among you, giving them food and clothing. And you are to love those who are foreigners for you yourselves were foreigners in Egypt. God sent the prophets again and again to share this message. Whatsoever you do, amen, whatsoever you do to the least of my brothers, that you do unto me. How do we speak the truth to our fear, need for power, hatred, and resentments? Reconciliation cannot begin without repentance. Real healing cannot restore relationship until there is an acknowledgement of the wrong. In the Bible, when people sinned, all were responsible. Everyone was affected. The land cries out for justice. How we stand up against evil action without becoming evil ourselves. For we too are sinners. We are all sinners. We are all sinners. We wrestle with fears, need for power, hatred and resentments. Our hope is built on Jesus. Speak the truth. Admit we are sinners. Admitting our failures, looking within ourselves, seeking change. The sickness is systemic. It is cultural, it is corporate. It is all of us together, broken and sinful. Let's own that, let's own it. We must admit this, what do we do? We can choose to ignore it, pretend it's not happening. We can choose to embrace it and say, we want to be violent or we choose to be an agent for change. We must decide to love like God loves, advocate for the poor, stand for justice and righteousness. What is the Christian's response to violence? Amen, what is the Christian's response to violence? It's love. It's love. Yes, it is love. Pray for the peace of our nation. He leaves the church to carry out the mission of the kingdom of God. How are we doing that? Are we living out the values of the kingdom? What is the vision? Does your home, school, workplace, neighborhood, city, state, county reflect the kingdom of God? Where is the urgency of the church to bring about peace and justice of the kingdom? We are reminded every day that we should be doing something to respond to the ugliness of the world. Hopelessness and resiliency coexist. We must go where no one else is going. We must have a fire hydrant of hope. Amen. It takes time. 
not a quick response. The causes of the uptick in violence, the deterioration in the family, lack of stability, systemic issues, apathetic church, we are not here to maintain. We are here to carry out the mission of the kingdom of God. Amen. Amen. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. The sickness is communal. The solution is communal. We can change it together. I ask for you to consider for 30 days at three o'clock in the afternoon, recite the Lord's Prayer and ask God to lay something on your heart, to lay something on your heart as an action to bring about peace. Amen. My sisters and brothers in Christ, a life living in Christ is a life that loves and serves others. Service to the poor that listens, that loves, encourages, respects, and helps those in your midst, especially those from the bottom of the social class. This is the heart of Jesus and should be our heart as well as we seek to live in fellowship with him. This God we serve, this God we serve is in the business of taking our violence, our fears, our hatred, our chaos, and saying to your sin, your hatred, your evil inclinations, the worst that you can do, it is not the end of the story. The resurrection, the resurrection is the end of the story. Hope is the end of the story. Love is the end of the story. Jesus triumphing over the grave and bring a new life is the end of our story. Our story is full of darkness Church, we know it ends in glorious light. For our hope lies in Christ. Amen. 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 Good evening, Assumption Church family. It is our pleasure to be with you sharing our Lenten reflection. Thank you, Father Joe, for allowing us to be with you. We especially want to thank our dear friend and my brother Deacon, Kevin Zidell, for the invitation to be here. May God continue to bless these men of God. And may God continue to bless the Assumption Church family. 
God bless you. Thank you.